Hello and thanks for joining us. My name is Beck Neal and I'm one of the church pastors from Voyage. If you're new with us today, and especially if you're new to church or to Christianity, we're really glad to have you with us. We often have visitors at our in-person services where we hold those at the Tormina Community Centre in Tormina. And we have uh, visitors joining us online, including people who are at all different stages in their relationship or walk with God. So welcome and especially welcome today because we commence a new series, What's Gone Wrong? Before I begin, I want to give credit to Matthias Media as we're using the content of Two Ways to Live with some additions and variations. So let's begin. What's gone wrong? You don't have to be alive long to see and to feel the very real problem of suffering and pain in our world. There are political and racial and family divides, civil and international wars and rumors of wars. And what about, what about the earth? What about the fires and floods and droughts and famines or epidemics? Pandemics, we all know what they're about. Disease, sicknesses, mental health, depression, addictions, and suicide. And I don't know about you, but to me, things only seem to be getting worse and not better. The widening disparity between the rich and the poor and if you do land somewhere in the middle, the current rapid rising costs of living. I mean, coal shortages and, you know, it's just, it's almost like you turn on the news and think, what's coming next? It's clear that something's not right. So this series, What's Gone Wrong, is a summary of the whole Bible presented over six weeks that fits logically together to address the question of what's gone wrong in our world. We want to explain clearly and help you know the answer along with the life-changing Christian message of hope. There is hope. So let's begin. And we begin with God as a loving ruler and creator. We're going to read now from the Bible because that's where God speaks to us. And the passage that I'll be reading from is from a book called Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. And here's what it says. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honour and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. The Bible tells us that it was God who created everything that's been made in the universe. Things we can see and things we cannot see. But why is it important to start this series, What's Gone Wrong, with God as Creator? Well, without an understanding of God as Creator, it's difficult to understand what sin actually is and why there's judgment for sin. It's also difficult to understand why Jesus Christ, who is God's son, came to earth to die for sinners and then rose again to resurrection life in order to give people new life, eternal life, life now, a new life now, a life eternal and living with hope with their creator. So for these reasons, God as the creator of everything that we see, including us, is crucial in knowing what's gone wrong with humanity and the world. And the truth that God is the creator of all things is the basis upon which the Bible describes him as the Lord of all things, and therefore he deserves and is worthy of all honor, thanks and obedience. God as the creator is the primary description of him in the Bible. You'll find it all over the Old Testament, which is the first section of the Bible before Jesus came to earth. 
from the majestic opening passages from the book of Genesis. That's the first book in the Bible. And the word Genesis means origin or creation or the beginnings. So we see how God created everything in Genesis. And then we also see equally the breathtaking closing passages from the book called Job. It's also all over the Psalms that God is the Lord of all, the creator of all, and is to be praised by all. It's throughout the writings of the prophets as well, demonstrating that God is both the Lord of all the earth and of all people. It's actually also part of the criticism in the Bible against idol worship, people who worship idols. Because unlike God, idols create nothing. In fact, they're created out of what's been created, like stone and wood. We don't see a lot of that in Australia, but if you go to other countries, you see a lot of temples and, and statues and carvings being worshipped. But yet they're made out of created things. They have no power. The basic belief of the first part of the Bible, the Old Testament, is that God is the creator of everything, the Lord and ruler of all. Now, in the New Testament, which is the second section of the Bible, when the good news about Jesus is first proclaimed to Jewish people, the early disciples and apostles didn't bother establishing God as the creator who has a claim on their lives because the Jewish people already understood this to be true from the Old Testament scriptures. Rather, what they do is they go straight to persuading their audience, which is primarily Jewish, at the beginning, that Jesus is the Messiah, their promised and expected deliverer, which was promised and prophesied throughout the Old Testament. However, in the New Testament, when addressing non-Jewish people, as in the book of Acts chapter 14 and Acts chapter 17, the Apostle Paul, he begins right at creation. He begins with God as the creator of all things. It's foundational because creation is the starting point for everything and everyone. Get that wrong and you're completely down a different path. And for some who may believe in some kind of God or some kind of presence or force, they might not know about the true God, the true God of the Bible, the one who made, who created everything. You see, in learning the answer to the question, what's gone wrong, this is where we must be, uh, begin. With the description of God in the way the Bible identifies him, that he is the one who created the world and everything in it by the breath of his mouth. We're going to go over three key concepts. Firstly, God as creator of the world. Throughout the Bible, it's very clear that God made everything without exception. In John, in the New Testament, chapter 1, verse 3, it says, Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. God makes everything and in great detail, right down to the child who is knitted together in their mother's womb as Psalm 139 puts it. What's more, he makes it out of nothing. It was not the forming or fashioning of pre-existing materials into something more useful, but it was bringing things into existence from nothing simply by the word of his mouth. In God creating everything, Everything had a purpose and a value. He did it for good. As Genesis chapter 1, the very first book of the Bible, repeats over and over. It says, God spoke and, there, and said, let there be light. And there was light and God saw that it was good. And every time God was creating, he was saying, oh, it's good. 
This is good. The world created by God is very good. It's very wise. It's so complex. It shows the wisdom of God. And it's very good. And this is very important to know. Some people think that, phys- that, that, sorry, that the physical world is evil and somehow contaminates us and it needs to be avoided if we're going to seek God. But this is the exact opposite to the way the Bible pictures creation and the world. God said it was good. And finally, we see throughout the Bible, the whole creation points to God's glory. It points to his wisdom, to his intelligence, to his power. Psalm 19 says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. I encourage you, actually read that whole psalm talks about all of creation. And then in Romans, in the New Testament, chapter 1, verse 20, the Bible says, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made. This is saying that creation speaks of a creator. That when you spend your time just looking at creation, the sunrises, the sunsets, the mountains, the rivers, the oceans, the wildlife, like it's just speaking uh, an intelligent design, a creator behind it all. This leads us to the second concept. God is not only the creator of all things, but the loving ruler of all things. These two concepts are closely related. It's a key element in our opening scripture from Revelations chapter 4 that says, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. It is so important to understand and talk about creation because it establishes God's rule or his claim over creation. You see, we owe God honor and glory. We owe him thanks and submission, not simply because he is bigger and more powerful than us, and not simply because he's so marvelous and holy and wise and good, but because he created us. He created all things, including us. Therefore, he owns everything. He provides everything. He sustains everything and he rules over everything. Now, God's rule of the creation is continual and ongoing. The world is not a natural machine, as the deists say. That is, their view is a belief in a God who created the world but has no ongoing involvement. They would say creation is like a piece of clockwork that God made. He wound it up, he set it going, and he has no further engagement. However, the Bible says in Psalm 145 verse 15, actually it says very differently to that. The Bible says the eyes of all look to you and you give them their food at the proper time. You open your hand and satisfy the desires of every living thing. You see, God continues to rule and supervise all of creation. The world only operates in the regular and rational way that it does because God continues to sustain and uphold it in a regular and consistent way. He also rules over humanity because we are part of his creation and he is sovereign over all of us, over everything. Furthermore, this rule of God that is loving, it is with a good purpose. From the very beginning, God makes the world a good 
and habitable place for a reason. And that reason is only finally understood with the coming of his son, Jesus Christ. The New Testament says that Jesus is the agent of God's creation as the divine word. Now, just listen. If you think, what did you just say? Just hopefully it'll unfold. In John chapter 1 in the New Testament, when Jesus first arrives on the scene, the Bible says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. That's the beginning of beginning, the creation. Through Him, all things were made. We're talking about Jesus. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. And if you open back up to that first book in the Bible, Genesis uh, chapter 1, it starts in exactly the same way. From John chapter 1, when it was talking about Jesus. Now let's listen to the creation account. In Genesis 1, it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, you can read on. Uh, consider reading Genesis chapters 1 and 2 just to see how God created everything through speaking the word. But I hope we're starting to get a connection here because not only is Jesus the agent for creation, that he was there in the beginning, it happened through Christ, through the spoken word, right? So that Jesus is referred to as the word of God. So he wasn't only the agent, but he was the reason for creation. Everything exists for God's son, Jesus Christ. And for more, let me explain. Colossians 1 verse 15 to 17 says, The Son, God's Son, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven, things on earth, visible, invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. God created the world for humanity, for mankind, and the ultimate man for who it was made and who now rules it is Jesus Christ. And that brings us to our third concept humanity as rulers. Humanity is part of the creation. We are not outside of it. We're part of it. And so we are dependent on God for everything. In Acts chapter 17, verse 28 in the Bible, it says, for in him, as in for in God, we live and move and have our being. That's right, isn't it? For in God we live and move and have our being. This is true. If God didn't create us and breathe life into us, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be alive. Every breath that we take is by God's doing. We have been made in the image of God. Our special place in creation is captured by the idea of us being made in the image of God. Now, this has various meanings in the Bible, but the main one is that we rule or have dominion over the world under God. This is seen again in Genesis chapter 1, where the phrase occurs, made in God's image. We are to have dominion, to rule over the world and to be responsible for it, to steward it well, to manage, to multiply the good things that the earth provides. And in this, we are like God. We are made in his image, for that is what he does. 
He rules over the world. Furthermore, in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 7, it says that Jesus, who is like humanity, was made a little lower than the angels. But unlike humanity, which fails to lovingly rule over everything, we see Jesus crowned with glory and honor and who now rules the world, having suffered uh, death on behalf of us all. But there's going to be more detail on that in the coming weeks. Jesus is both God and man. Jesus is what we were truly created to be. And when we are transformed into his image, the image of God's son, we become what God made us to be. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. But there'll be more about the new humanity that God is transforming by his spirit again later in the series. For now though, here are some alternatives and one objection to God as a creator for you to consider. The first alternative is materialism or accidentalism. This view is that physical matter is all that exists. We are here, because we are here, because we are here, because we are here. The world has no creator and therefore no ruler. All that exists is just physical matter, accidentally forming itself into various forms of complexity and order. Now, this, it's a marvelous idea. Yeah, it is, because it makes us answerable to no one. But it's a terrible idea because it makes the world and us completely meaningless. Accidents are meaningless. Manufactured items are meaningful because their meaning is given by the maker. But of course, once you have a maker, you're responsible to your maker. Once you have a creator, the created has a responsibility and people don't want that. The second alternative is mysticism, a very different alternative and one that comes in various forms. It's the idea that the non-physical world, the spiritual world is the real world and that the physical one is either evil or not really real. It's the kind of view we see in most Eastern religions such as Buddhism, and Hare Krishna, and in various New Age versions as well. According to the Bible, it's actually a demonic view because the world is good, and it's good because it's been created by God who is good, and it should be received with thanksgiving. The third alternative that I mentioned earlier is deism, where the world is a machine running without God's involvement. It's the God of the philosophers, but it's not the God of the Bible. The deist God is an absentee God. He's not around much. And so, you know, he only knows, you only know that he exists when maybe a miracle takes place, when he just dabbles his fingers in the machine. But when a sparrow falls to the ground, even though it appears just to be a natural event, the Bible says it only takes place because of the will of the Father. And when God did a miracle in the Old Testament, when he parted the Red Sea, it was a great miracle, no doubt, but he did it by a strong east wind. You see, God is in control. You don't see God just in the miraculous or the unexplainable. You see him all the time. And the fourth alternative, or this one's an objection to God's creation, is the problem of evil. 
Now there isn't room to deal with this big topic here except to say two things. Firstly, if a person has a problem with evil, then at some level there's a belief in God's good creation. Because if you've got a problem with it, there's an expectation that the world should be good. But if the world was an accident, then it's not evil. It's meaningless because accidents are meaningless. You can't complain about an accident being evil or good. It, it just happens. And the second uh, and related point is if evil is normal or meaningless, you just put up with it. But if evil is abnormal, you know, it gets to you. It, it stirs you. It does something that this isn't right. Then it is the opposite to what you expect. And if you complain about it, then what are you going to do about it? And that's a great question. It's the question the message of the Bible is all about. So, in conclusion, God as the creator and loving ruler is the foundation to the Bible and to Jesus Christ. God as the creator establishes his relationship with all the created order, including us, including humanity. Because he is the powerful creator of all things, he is the ruler and the Lord of all things. And he is worthy to receive glory, honor and power. And because he's a loving ruler, we can expect his purpose for his creation will be good and loving. Without creation, we cannot understand who God is or even which God we might be talking about. And without creation, we cannot understand why we owe God honor, thanks and obedience and why our rebellion against God is so dreadful and deserving of judgment. Furthermore, in God creating humanity, he gave us a special place in creation as good and loving rulers under God. This mandate foreshadowed the coming of Jesus Christ the God-man, who really will rule the world and bring God's future plan into being. But there is much to cover before we get to that session. Now that we've laid down God as the loving ruler and creator, next we're going to look at what has gone wrong with us. What's gone wrong with us, the world and our relationship with God? Look, I really hope that you'll join us again next week for part two of our six-part series, What's Gone Wrong? This is a summary of the whole Bible that fits logically together to address this question and may even answer a few more. We want to explain clearly and help people to know the answer along with the life-changing Christian message of hope. See you again soon.